Mitchell Stankovic and Associates, and the Underground Ideas into Action presents the Underground Chats, authentic conversations with credit union thought leaders. Today's chat, Adapt and Overcome, with Tony Battelle, President and CEO of CU Direct. Um, all right. So how are you? Good, good. Uh, you know, I'm here in uh, Laguna Beach. Uh, is, it, is the lighting, I mean, the, the sun is coming through the window right now, and I've just put the shades down some, but it's still like there. I have panoramic view of the ocean right now, so it's <laughs> it's it's nice, but uh, uh, but sometimes it gets a little bright in here at this time of day. It actually looks great. Yeah, okay. you yeah. look super. And um, I was going to mention, I like the little stubble. And, oh, know. and I got, you know, this is a comes and goes in this COVID world. It's like you don't have that, you know, you know, who's buying, you know, nice clothes today and stuff. It's just crazy The you know, it, it's such a different world we're in, right? It really is. And I think that you're in, um, you know, Southern California and we're in outside of Las Vegas. And so um, you're having more of a surge right now than we are, but it's just the reality is like when you get your hair done, when you, when you do the, the basic things. And I don't know about you, but we're incredibly busy. I mean, there's a lot happening and being on Zoom calls and being really on call pretty much um, in 12 hour days. So it's, no, it's, it's a good I, thing, but it's busy. I, I um, it seems like it's busier, really, really. I mean, in some ways, um, you know, because you're, you're always prepping for the next Zoom call or our, we use Microsoft Teams a lot, but um, same thing. It's just, uh, and it's just a different, you know, engagement though, too, especially when you have, when it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's a little easier to, you feel, you know, it's similar, I think, than what you were if you were in person, but um, when it's a bigger group, then it becomes a little, little different, I think. Yeah. And it's interesting because I, I really see the evolution of our virtual as well. When we started um, last year, after everything took place, it was like, okay, any kind of communication works. Let's just get it done. Right. And now we're having higher expectations. And I think the, the preparation has to be to the, to a greater level. So, and that's really where I want to, you know, start when we take a look at, at kind of what's happened um, with in the industry, we almost have to look at consumer behavior too. And with CU Direct and now Origins, um, uh, pronounce it for me properly. Origins. Okay. Origins, yeah. So Origins, and that are they all, so tell us a little bit about the story of the update um, and where you are currently from a QSO perspective. Okay. Well, uh, we are changing our, our product name. Our company still is CU Direct. That's the holding company. And uh, that really has two brands in it. Cuddle, the credit union direct lending brand that we work with our auto dealers on to make, make loans for credit unions across the country. And Origins, which is really all of our lending products. And it's our new, our new way of uh, kind of uh, cr creating an origination uh, product lineup. And really our our mission and vision in, in this world is to create the ultimate origination experience for members. And it's across all product lines. So we just rolled out our new uh, mortgage platform and uh, we are uh, connecting it to all our other platforms to create one application to really make all loan types work, uh, new account opening, everything. So it's a, it's a big undertaking, uh, but we started with the most complex one first, which is mortgage. And uh, we've got about, 10 credit unions signed up for that now and um, and some mortgage banks too by the way that are also part of the part of the family I know you I know we're all about credit unions but one thing is that you can't pay for technology uh, if you're just focused on a, on a you know a small niche in the marketplace you've got it and, uh, and again credit unions are a fairly big niche when it comes to you know I think they're 25 percent in the auto uh, area and probably 10% in the, in the mortgage area, but still, if, if you leave it to that, it's really hard to pay for um, technology if you limit yourself to just that. So we did, uh, even though we're owned by credit unions, we, we are uh, selling to mortgage banks and to banks right now. 
Yeah, I think it makes sense. I think it's like anything else. There was a, an article today um, talking about the impact of fintech and the impact of what's taking place around us. So the idea that we can stay narrowly focused and yet broaden our consumer reach is probably one that we need to update. Um, so that's that's great to hear. So did this, um, I know that this has been a long-term strategy for you. Did it um, escalate in 2021, or excuse me, in 2020 based upon the virtual transition? Um, what happened in 2020 for you guys? Well, you know, like like everyone, we we uh, pivoted. Uh, probably the most overused and and you word in uh, in twenty twenty is uh, we we had to move like everybody else did to work from home, and uh, you know we did that pretty quickly. We had a you know I think for the first three months, I think I had daily what called pandemic calls with our executive team uh, to ma- really make sure that everyone had the right equipment, had the right you know, we had the right teams working together. We had the right cadence of meetings that we were going to do that are, you know, virtual now versus in person. And, uh, and it worked out. I mean, it worked out pretty good. I, I think, you know, just like most companies today, I've, I've talked to several credit unions that are saying, hey, we're never going to have our, you know, call centers come into the, the work really. Our very few times it will come in maybe for training and things like that, but they're going to be pretty much work from home going forward. We're probably going to see some of that too. And probably in the 40 to 60 percent of our workforce will continue to work from home over over the you know in the future here because we know it works um you know that the it's very um it's you, you got to stay on top of it you got to make sure that you know you're understanding what you're asking your your team to do when they're working from home and uh and i think there's also a cadence to trying to get them into back into the office at some point to make sure that you know you're staying in touch with them in a personal way because it is a different world, right? I mean, I think some, you know, when you have, what has it been like 10 months now that, you know, that you've, you know, effectively I, there's people I used to see every day that I have not seen once in person yet, you know, and, uh, and it's just a different, it's a different relationship that you, you, st- you set up. And uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, mental health, uh, you know, kind of strains going on with our, with our teams. Uh, we, uh, we've been trying to do a lot more uh, you know, kind of games and things like that that we did around the holidays and giving away gifts and having games at least monthly with our with, with, that we just have people come to like a, a Zoom call to uh, to just relax and have happy hour or whatever it is you know to try to to try to get them to engage at a different level whether it's just business and and you know that works to a certain extent I think we've we we bought this game called Cahoots I don't know if you've ever heard of that but it's kind of a fun trivia game that uh, everybody plays and. And I have some fun with that, that that works on the on Zoom and things like that. Well, I love the idea that you're um, you're taking your team and you're kind of exploring new ideas and and trying to continue the culture. I I, I find it interesting your comment about health and you know we have the physical health that's kind of in our face every day. The mental health um, as we look to 2021. One of the things we called it shift happens, by the way, instead of uh, pivoting, because we just really got to the point where it's like, this is like crazy. Um, But as we look towards 2021, I think there was this feeling that, okay, things are going to be different. We're going to see behaviors, you know, change and, um, and, and, Obviously, the la- the first uh, few weeks of Jan- of uh, 2021 have been um, extreme for all of us in looking at how we're going to deal with things. But I think the mental aspect was one that particularly hit me was the idea that um, I guess uh, you know I'm ready for fresh starts. I'm all about writing my goals and my vision board, and I'm like ready to rock and roll. And it's like, oh, okay, we're not there yet. Before we leave 2020, you also have um, a very interesting interesting perspective on how the um, financial services. Um, industry is going to do with the consumer change with buying cars and kind of the disruption that happened there. Will you tell us about, I know there was a major disruption and then I think it started to, um, you know, mellow out in some respects, but what's happening with cars and, and mortgages probably went through the roof. But yeah, yeah. Mortgages for sure are, are still on fire and, and cars are, you know, I think they're back to more normal levels now as far as uh, sales go and, and production. You know, the, the plants actually uh, closed down in, in March, April, May. And, you know, there's been kind of a, a, 
a pent up, uh, you know, in, you know, demand and, and the inventory hasn't been there. So, so used car prices went through the roof this last year um, because of that. And, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, how people buy cars, I, it's changed. It's, it's definitely, uh, people are accepting uh, buying used cars now uh, online. We're actually seeing Carvana doing a really good job of that. And you saw, you know, all the ads on that, they deliver it to your house and it's a, it's a, you know, even though they have those those vending machine things that they that they put out there, that's kind of a kind of a gimmicky thing. But now that with COVID, they basically deliver it to your house, and and uh, you know, there's a lot of projections that uh, it's going to go to like I think they're showing by 2030, uh, Carvana at least is that you know that seven million uh, used cars will be del- will be bought all online. You know, and they did they did a, a tremendous amount this year too. So. I think, you know, the acceptance of, of buying, you know, again, in the past, I don't think people would ever buy a car without driving it first, right? But because of the reliability of it and the, and, and the fact that you can see so many things via video now and be able to really look at how uh, quality something is, uh, that people aren't, aren't having to have that, uh, that experience. Although uh, on the new car side, you know, the, because of franchise laws, they all still have to be bought through dealerships um, and uh, and bought at a dealership. So so those are are probably not going to change until the franchise laws change a whole lot, except for the Teslas of the world or the new electric car companies that are coming on that are selling direct. Uh, some of those um, laws are starting to you know actually change a bit. Uh, Colorado had the first uh, change in their laws where any new electric car companies can sell direct to uh, to customers where you know the traditional franchise dealers out there are going to fight that and you're seeing that in state by state but uh but that is i think the future is that you're going to uh, you're going to see at least the new car companies come on the rivians of the world you've seen, maybe seen that car it's a new electric car that uh ford and amazon are big investors in uh they're all starting out without the franchise uh, approach and they're going to sell direct like tesla has for since they started um, so there's a lot of changes going on in the in the uh, industry. I think the the uh, uh, the cars are moving more towards electric. The 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 whole um, industry is, you know, probably changing from the standpoint of uh, these big these big franchise dealers. These big lots are probably not going to be as important in the future as they are today. They're going to be probably smaller maybe come and, you know, just like Tesla does have just a, you can test drive them, but then they you order the car and you, you, you go pick it up in a different location. Uh, that is probably more of how uh, dealers are going to work too in the future. Um, but again, there's these franchise laws are pretty, pretty tough to change. I think that's going to, that's going to make this industry be a lot of the same for a long period of time too. So the delivery mechanism may uh, continue to be the same volume online and then going to the, um, the dealerships. What about the, the overall volume? Um, you said used cars picked up. Are we going to see greater lending in, um, in the auto industry in 2021? Are we going to remain um, kind of at the levels that we are today? Uh, it's probably going to go up a bit this year, but you know, the, the projections, the ones we've seen are not a tremendous amount. I think we probably ended the year with, I didn't even actually look at that before we got on here, but probably in the 14 million new car range, uh, probably in the, you know, 37 million or so used cars transactions that were done, you know, it may get to close to 40 in the, um, in the used car. And I think they're talking like 15, 15, five. Uh, 0.5 million new cars next year for sell, selling. You know, for many years, we were selling over 17 million cars a year for like five years in a row. So it has come down some. Um, it, it, what a lot of uh, projections are because of how long cars are lasting too, is that we're probably going to just stay in this same range in this same million plus million less uh, of new cars for some period of time for uh, as we, uh, as you know, some people, don't feel they need cars as much anymore. There's some of that going on, right? You know, they they can uh, Uber around, which which got which kind of got a, a little bit of a uh, you know wake up call, I guess, with COVID. Uh, a lot of people stopped using. Uh, in fact, that's why used cars went up in price. Used car demand went up so high during COVID because people stopped public transportation. They stopped doing Uber. They 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 basically needed a car again. All those people that didn't. Uh, 
didn't need a car before suddenly felt like they needed a car, right? So uh, prices went up quite a bit this last year, but I think it's it's definitely leveling, leveling back off. That, um, that's very interesting. That's like a um, um, blinding flash of the obvious, and we'll get to that in a minute. But as soon as you said that, I went, yeah, duh. One thing that I do want to expand the perception is I'm asking you about automobiles, and, um, and that's a very traditional question um, with you. But the reality is that Seat Direct now is all about innovation and all about looking to the future. And I've heard you speak many times, both on on a national level as well as an international level about what you see in the future. And I know you've done the innovation lab in um, Orange County. So I just want to take a minute and have you tell us a little bit about the, your commitment to innovation. Yeah, uh, you know, the, 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 big, the big innovative thing I think we're doing this year is the whole concept of, you know, every, uh, credit union in the past, had, and there's all these technology products out there for loans, right? And they all kind of go for this best of breed approach, whether it's a credit card loan or a consumer loan or, or I mean, auto loan or a mortgage loan. And there's all these different systems that you have to uh, uh, get an application on and they don't talk to each other. So it, it's never really been done before, but we are the first uh, and our board is very supportive of investing in this is to be able to have one application that based on what that member says they want, they want a new account, they want a credit card, they want a mortgage, whatever that happens to be, it dynamically changes the questions. And again, you can imagine the questions are much more on a mortgage than they are on a credit card, but based on what that member picks, it's a similar experience and you can share that data across all the platforms. So that's, that is probably the most innovative thing that we are working towards today. And we've made a huge stride in that. One of the big, bigger things too, that we took out of the innovation lab was, um, this whole concept of, uh, of you know, uh, the paper that you deal with when it comes to lending and, and all of the, um, uh, and all of the stuff, especially when it comes to indirect lending, we, we took a, uh, uh, we, we, we studied what you could do to use um, uh, automated or, um, gosh, what do we call it? Uh, the uh, uh, character recognition, uh, optical character recognition, and the whole concept of, of being able to look at a, a, a document and put it in the right order. Because when it comes to, to uh, indirect lending, these big departments that are doing indirect loans are getting these packages of paper coming in from dealerships, and they're all in a different order, right? And being able to look at those in uh, on, on an image basis and have them coming into our system, on a, uh, the dealer actually sends them in on an image basis. We put them in the right order. We stack them the right order, and we send them back out to the credit union to actually finish processing. That by itself saves credit unions a ton of money. We we did this for Golden One Credit Union. Just give you an example. Golden One says they saved five full time equivalents, and we in, increased the dealer's uh, funding within a, a day, a uh, twenty four hour period of time by just putting it in the right order because it takes so much time just to sort it out and put, put it together. So what all we can do with um, uh, being able to uh, take this paper and all these kind of manual operations, so either stacking it or then taking it and making sure that the phone numbers match up and all the different things, we can do that all through an automated process now today and, and be able to uh, really set it up almost for funding for somebody to just final, you know, to click the final button on it. So we're doing a lot to try to create a, uh, uh, as much automation and all of the stare and compare that you had to do as a indirect lending, you know, kind of person, you could focus more on relationships with dealers and things like that. Uh, we, we think we're, we're taking a big bite out of the cost of things for credit unions and what they, what they have to do to produce uh, indirect loans. Yeah, I think the cost, as well as from a consumer expectation standpoint, one of the things that's happened this last year, as we all were forced to, to basically work from home and order from home and, and buy you know, groceries from home, I mean, all the things that, that took place, the more the seamless experience was enhanced, the better. And so I believe that that's one of those areas that we won't go back on. I mean, my patience level and time commitment to things has always been somewhat short, but the idea that um, we have to go through all those steps 
um, is something that I think we're going to look for efficiency. And I know this year there was um, the survey that was has been done for many years. I talked to Frank Diekman recently, and we were looking at the surveys of um, service with um, you know credit unions and banks and, and fintechs and so on. And one of the deciding factors was technology, as you just indicated. It's like we, we want our technology, no matter the size of our organization, to be seamless. So that's sort of a pretty progressive step. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, it's kind of the Amazon effect, I think, to everybody, you know, that everyone's got that expectation now that you're going to make it uh, a lot easier on me. And, you know, that's, that's, I think, the expectation that we have to get to, you know, and, and the reality that we got to, we got to deliver to our members. I think there was something else in the Amazon effect that happened during fourth quarter. And it's what I call the, um, uh, the whole idea of, of under promise and over deliver. You know, how many times did you get a thing that says COVID is affecting our delivery and, mm-hmm. and so on? And so it may be, you know, two or three weeks and then you get it within the normal time frame. And I'm going, yeah, that's very cool. Well, it's the whole idea that I had set my expectations at a different level. So, um, so we always want to over um, deliver. Um, so as we start to look into 2021, and I'm all about the idea that not only have we from um, a consumer standpoint changed, we also from a business standpoint, you just mentioned we'll have potentially less footprint, we're going to do things in a different way, we're going to be reaching consumers directly, there's less of an interface. I mean, there are, I think, long term um, changes that will take place, even though we all miss being in DC, um, and the idea of getting together and and writing on napkins so that we could, um, you know, share ideas. I think that 2021 is going to be a hybrid of things. So you mentioned the idea of, you know, the, if we're not using Uber, what are we going to use? And of course, we're going to go to, you know, something used or something that we could um, afford. What other things do you think are going to be a direct result of, of 2020 and, and kind of blinding flashes of the obvious, the BFOs that we'll take into 2021? You know, I, I think we're all, you know, living it with the whole work from home thing is probably going to be <clears throat> something that will continue. Um, you know, the, the thing I would just say on the, the whole work from home is just how, how um, uh, you have to be so careful, I think, because we have these, um, we're hiring a lot of people right now. And, and uh, we've hired probably in the last six months, 100 people. And we probably have 100 people more to hire. I mean, we're really trying to, we're investing in this platform. And, and uh, as we're hiring them, um, you know, of course, we're having them work from home. Uh, and, you know, these people, we have no relationship with them hardly at all. And, and I would just put a little caution out there for those that, that, that watch this. And that is, um, we, we had an employee in our, I think it was in our engineering department that we never met before. You know, we all hired him over the, over the internet or over, you know, virtually. And, and he, he started and his supervisor was like not getting a whole lot out of him. And, and, and you know, weeks were going by and we're like, uh, Hey, are you, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we're, this isn't really working out. We ended up actually telling him that uh, we, and, and he'd probably been there for almost two months. Um, and we found out that he never quit his other job. You know, the, <laughs> the thing about this whole thing is that you could be so, you know, how many people are actually working two jobs in the same hours, you know, with some of these jobs that we have today, you could possibly play that game a little bit. So you have to be somewhat careful. I think here is, uh, is, that work from home is really, uh, I think, working generally speaking, and, and where where it's worked best for me, at least when I when I have meetings with our team, is that I already knew all these people really well, right? I haven't yeah. changed my team, but but it's all the new people that you bring on, and you don't you don't have that relationship with them, and you know you just you know how do you? So I think what we've really tried to do is we're asking the new people to actually come in, although this isn't working in every case because they're not in the, not in near a, an office. But when they're near an office, we do try to get them to come in for their first few weeks to really, you know, kind of get to know them and, and, and get to know their, their jobs a little better and their supervisors. So there is a um, <clears throat> there is a little risk, I think, in this work from home. But I do think that is still going to continue. I think the other big thing that I see a huge advantage in in this um, 
you know, we used to do quarterly senior management, or uh, uh, yeah, senior management team meetings. We had all of our vice presidents and above, about 40 people. Uh, they're all they're all over the country. Fly them in, do a two day meeting, cost a fortune, right? I mean, I'm doing them now. Uh, well, for a while there, we were doing them, you know, weekly. Now we're doing them. I think every two weeks, our senior management team meetings, all virtually. All, you know, I think we're more connected today than we've ever been because of uh, how we give the floor to different people. We give them a, a time to talk. You could never have done that. Even in these two day meetings, there was just too much to talk about. We, you know, they, there wasn't, you know, there was the sidebars, I think, that are still valuable in that, you know, that with that personal interaction. But but these uh, being able to have a, uh, a Zoom call with 40 people on it. And to be able to cover the kind of material that we cover to really keep everybody connected has really been a valuable thing. And I think, you know, we're never going to, you know, we'll, we'll have some in-person meetings, but very few compared to what we did have. I agree. Our business is obviously dependent upon travel and meeting people and being out with our credit unions. But I really saw 2020 become the year of intimate conversations through virtual. And because of access points and no limitation on timing, I think that became um, an important part of our journey and our growth last year. So I look to the future and say, okay, we'll keep that going. So two ideas into action. Um, I think you just talked about them. I, I do want to say that what that reminded me of when you were talking about the two jobs concept is the fact that is that kind of like we pretend we're on um, a virtual conference and we're actually doing work, but we <laughs> have to be in. You do. You got to. You got to have. You, you do have to trust but verify kind of things, right? I think there is a little <laughs> bit of that. I mean, just realizing this guy never quit his other job is almost like. <laughs> How could that be? You know, but you, you can see that happening, right? In a, in a, especially in a tech company where you could be, you know, maybe doing. And again, if it's disclosed, that might be one thing. But if, that you have something else going on. But but if you're literally trying to do two jobs and they they both think you have the same amount of time that you're putting in, uh, that that might not might not be really a <clears throat> good way to go. So. But um, a couple of things that, you know, I would, you know, one thing that really uh, struck me this last year, and I think a lot of companies sort of a wake up call is this whole, you know, George Floyd, all the all the issues with um, kind of diversity and inclusion. And, and we spent a lot of time this last year really creating uh, a more open and inclusive, I think, organization. And one of the big things that I, I would, uh, you know, recommend uh, pursuing if, if your organization is of any size is trying to do these uh, enterprise resource groups. So we've put together at least, I think, five so far. Uh, we've got a, we've got a women in automotive group. We've got a black and brown group. We've got a, a, a Latino group. We have an Asian group. Um, we, we, uh, we have an LBGTQ group. And they all meet to, I think, support each other and help their careers, but they also help us understand how to recruit better, how to, how to uh, have a be better uh, open uh, looking in different places for you know, qualified employees. So um, we really have uh, been happy with uh, the, the engagement that we've been able to get out of our, uh, our, our diversity inclusion uh, and our enterprise resource groups that we've had. We've really made it part of our values in the company. And I think we've gotten really good uh, reviews from our, our employees and uh, our, our teammates here to, to be, uh, you know, to be a, a place that they, that they would recommend other people to go to. And that's, I think, an important thing. Well, before we go on to your second one, I just want to reinforce, I think that's fabulous. Um, I am part of the uh, DEI collective a governing group. And it's very important, as you know, with all the different initiatives that we're doing. We also started CU Pride this year um, with the idea of being more inclusive and you know expanding voices. So congratulations on that. I think that's outstanding, Tony. Yeah, Good I think it's something that the, the creating industry really did kind of rally around that. We joined the DEI initiative too. And I think it's, uh, it's important that uh, we set the you know, kind of be leaders in this, I think. And, and uh, it is an important thing. Um, I, I, you know, the other one I, I did mention already, but I just say it again, the, the whole, I think just recognizing the, the you know, there's, there's whole, this whole issue, as I said earlier about the accountability part of, you know, working from home, but there's a, I think even a bigger issue about the mental health aspects of working from home and, and trying to get your employees to, 
you know, um, have some fun and and to try to do it obviously in, in different ways like we've been doing with some of these these games that we've been playing. I just recommend that as a as a uh, as something I think that really helps. Uh, you know, again, what I really focus on is how do you what are the ways we can try to get our our teammates engaged in what we're doing to be passionate about what we're doing and there's so many aspects to that as far as what your vision and mission is and getting them excited about that what the values of the company are what 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 you can do though to create uh some level of you know decreased stress in their lives and i think for those people that are working day in and day out from their house and we haven't seen them in months um you know trying to get them into the office trying to get you know in you know playing some of these games to make it less about just work and be a little a bit of fun i think is an important part of uh, uh you know engagement again with employees well um, i i i just want to reinforce you've, you've mentioned um mental health and i we've been looking at the divides that have happened in families the workplaces you know the constitution um vaccines um, there are just so many areas in our life right now that there's no clear answers. And I believe having the channels that you talked about, the ability to talk to each other, the ability to relax and get to know each other a little bit, but we do have to, to have that strong, I am human, I am, it's okay to be human conversations with each other. So um, I'm excited about that. I, am, I think that you're one of the, if not the, one of the most um, uh, impactful large uh, credit and service organizations in the industry. And with your expansion now to include other, um, other, I guess, target markets, I think that they, you'll continue to have the impact into the future. So one, one final question that I wanted you to, to comment on. I was looking today at the National Association of, of QSOs and I noticed that the growth in the number of QSOs, do you see that growth helping with the income issues that we're gonna have with credit unions? Just, you know, uh, just a final thought from you. The, the, the what? The, 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 just being able to tap our QSOs for net income and for, you know, balance sheet income, I think it's going to be a critical part of the financial story for credit unions in 2021. Well, I think, I think QSOs, you know, obviously do different things and, you know, they're either, they're, they're creating efficiencies and creating uh, more revenue opportunities. Um, uh, and I, you know, some of them are wholly owned and I know a lot of the QSOs that, uh, you know, like you see Westcom or Connector, some of these credit unions have, they, they actually contribute to the bottom line, but they're more wholly owned QSOs. We're a multi-owned QSO. So we're, our focus is really on how do we help you, you know, make more loans and improve your efficiencies. You know, that's our, that's our goal. Um, but, but I definitely think that uh, QSOs are the way to go, especially, you know, it, you know, credit unions have limited resources. I, I think it's, it's smaller and medium-sized credit unions in particular really need to rely on QSOs to help them you know, lower their cost of, of, of operations, which is, a, which is a, you know, really, really difficult to compete with these big trillion dollar banks, right? So, so absolutely, I think that's, uh, uh, I think CUSOs are gonna continue to grow. Uh, uh, we're a big part and you know you have been too in that CUSO and, um, and uh, we, 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 we work with a lot of CUSOs. There's a lot of CUSOs in our platform actually that we, that w w we probably have a dozen CUSOs that we do business with in, in uh, the credit union world. Uh, so it's definitely a, 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 I think, a cooperative environment that we're trying to help each other to just be better in the uh, credit in space. Well, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Take care. Okay. I'll see you guys. Okay.